the NPTA lecture series on animal physiology. So, we are in section 12 with the lecture 3. So, this is basically in the gastrointestinal physiology. So, we talked about the in the first lecture we talked about the overall architecture of the digestive system. We talked about how the nervous innervation of sympathetic and parasympathetic systems are kind of controlling the whole system the whole architecture. And then on in the second lecture we talked about the first part where the where the one second where the first intake of food takes place that is in the mouth in the saliva the function of the saliva how saliva secretion is being regulated and how the first phase of the food is being broken down into pieces before through bolus movement in the form of peristaltic movement it moves to the stomach. The stomach is the I should say the first after the mouth it is the first station through the esophagus it reaches the stomach. Stomach is the first station where the food is exposed to one of the most acidic environment in its old whole tract all the way excuse me all the way from mouth to excretion from anus. This particular structure is the most acidic where the pH almost hits upon 1 and even possible less and that is because of hydrochloric acid which is being produced by there are different cells there parietal cells, cell shells and everything. So, the way we are dividing the this particular class is we will talk about the anatomical feature of uh, stomach. From there we will move on to the different cellular structure and how they regulate the movement of H plus and C L minus ions which leads to the formation of hydrochloric acid and then we will talk about the different phases which regulate the whole digestion process. Okay, so, anatomically speaking so, if you look at the structure, so let us get back to the okay, section 12, section 12 lecture 3, <coughs> stomach. Okay. So, the overall structure, if you look at the stomach, the way it looks like it is a structure is physically looks something like this okay and of course not this oh, one second let me just just redraw it something like uh, where the food moves through the whole path now wait this is this is the wrong way to put it okay let me redraw it okay something like this okay so the food is coming i'm showing you the arrow this is how the food is entering and this is where the food moves to the small intestine and whatsoever happen everything happens in this zone okay so if you look at the very basic structure of it it is divided into four different parts parts are named as cardia, fundus, the body and the pylorus and pylorus. These are the four anatomical feature of stomach and each one of them have their own function and what I will do and there is something called pyloric sphincter which is present somewhere out here, which ensures this pyloric sphincter ensures that the when the food should be sent to the intestine till. So, it is kind of a control mechanism by which food is being ensured that the all the regurgitation, regurgitation all the chemical reactions takes place such a way that the food is now ready to be transported to the intestine, small intestine for further absorption and all other metabolic metabolism related events. Okay. So, now coming back to the structure with an anatomical feature of the structure. So, let me redraw this, so that I can label all it for you people. 
So, okay, fine. So, this is the entry port of the food. So, this is esophagus. So, then the food is entering. This is the fundus region, and this whole vessel. If I have to have a take a cross section of this, something like this. If you if you see across, if I take the upper view of it, you will see lot of blood vessels all over the place. Like likewise, okay. it is completely innervated with blood vessels. Likewise, so this is just the kind of a cross view. What I am trying to draw for you people. If it get an over upper view, then this zone is called cardia, and here you have a bunch of longitudinal muscle layer. There are two kinds of muscle arrangement here, longitudinal, and these are all smooth muscles, longitudinal muscle layer, and second one is series of circular muscle layer. And these longitudinal and circular muscle layer helps in the movement of the stomach, circular muscular layer or muscle layer. Okay. And then you have this is the this is the fundus, this is cardia and here is the body, the body part and this surface is called Ruge surface and this zone is called pyloric antrum and here is the pyloric sphincter pyloric sphincter and this part is called pyloric canal so, this is the overall geometry of the stomach. So, all these organs, most of these digestive organs or any of the secretory organs needs a site or needs a geometry or anatomy by which it can secrete. So, think of it you have, so when you have to, if you think of a pipe, okay, what happens a pipe which is a hose and the it started dumping out the fluid. So, what kind of pipe like structure this uh, stomach has? So, there we are entering after giving you this whole overall anatomical idea of it, I will move on to the cellular structure, how the cellular structure of uh, stomach looks like. Okay. Let us move on to the cellular structure and how these the histology and the cell and where all these different cells are. So, basically what we will be doing we will take up a cross section of this and we will move on to the cellular histological feature. Okay. So, the cellular structure the way it looks like, if you go through the cross section of the cellular structure, it looks something like this. It is a bit of a complex drawing, but bear with me, eventually it will look very straightforward. So, something like this, this is how the structure looks like, and even if you make a cross section, it will look like this only. Okay. So, and these are line by different cells like this. Okay. And I will give the different nomenclature. So, imagine it if we reverse it, it looks more like a pipe. Okay. So, I am just drawing one of them and I will leave the rest for you to for your imagination to take over. Okay. These are the different cells which are forming the structure. Okay. These are the nucleus I am putting. Okay. So, these are called 
these structures are called this gap what you see is called the gastric pit. Fine. And this these cells are called mucus cell lining, mucus epithelium. And within the mucus epithelium, we have some series of cells and underneath it and I will come in depth after I will just give you the overall underneath this you have the all the blood vessels which are moving through all this. Likewise, these are the blood vessels you see and along with the lymphatic vessels which are running along. Now, if I take a complete cross section of this something like this and redraw it how that will look like. So, where I will be talking about the different cell types which are involved in it. Okay. So, that will look like more like this again redraw that one small fragment that will help you to realize it better. Okay. I just picked up one of those gastric pits. Now, let us put all the cells which are present in the gastric pit. I am just doing it from the reverse side drawing the cells that makes life a little bit easier. So, these are the cellular lining which are forming the the gastric pits and underneath the gastric pits you have another series of cells which are forming the supporting cell to the gastric pits. Okay, and So, these are the nucleus okay. So, in this so I told you that these are the mucus cells and this zone what you see here is called the neck of the pit and within the neck of the pit underneath that you have some cells which I am just now putting in red. These are called parietal cells, parietal cells and underneath that I am putting them in green and the series of cells which are called chef cells and you have series of smooth muscles around it. And very very underneath out here you have certain cells which are called G cells. So, each one of these are formed of each one of those pits what I have drawn formed out of shape cells, parietal cells and the G cells. So, we started with the overall architecture, we talked about the position of the pylorus, fundus, body and the, the connecting tube okay. and then we talked about the basic cellular anatomy and we showed you the location of the gastric pit. So, through these gastric pits what I have drawn basically <coughs> through these pits you see the secretion of hydrochloric acid, how that happens. Now, we will move on to the production of hydrochloric acid. None of this, the cells which are involved in it, they do not produce hydrochloric acid, they produce so tell, let me give you the way they do it. They produce H plus ion and C L minus ion and they secrete it and then they interact and form hydrochloric acid. So, if a cell in its cytoplasm starts producing hydrochloric acid, then that, that cell is it is very difficult for that individual cell to survive. So, they do not 
do it like that and it is a mucus cell lining which prevents these cells from getting destroyed. Okay. So, now what we will do we will pick up the individual cell here and then we will talk about how it is forming the how it is helping in the formation of the hydrochloric acid. So, it's going back to the cellular geometry of it. Okay. So, we talked about the parietal cells. So, within the gastric pit now we are inside the gastric pit. So, within the gastric pit you have two types of secretory cells. So, first one is the parietal cells. These parietal cells are especially common along the proximal portion or you must have seen that in the picture. So, these are the these are the proximal section where they are fairly common they are along the proximal portion of the gastric pit portion of gastric pit and they secrete intrinsic factors like vitamin B 12. Okay. If you remember that this was helpful in vitamin B 12 is helpful in the RBC production. Okay. So, parietal cells the other function of parietal cells are a cell production. Okay. So, how it does so? So, let us look at the geometry of the parietal cells. They so, I am now I am at the cellular level. What I have drawn the just before this, now I am talking about the individual cells. So, let us take up this section. Okay. Now, what is happening is that we have talked about this reaction CO2 plus H2 in the presence of carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic and hydrase enzyme it form H 2 CO 3. H 2 CO 3 immediately dissociates into H plus and A C O 3 minus ions. Okay. Then what happens once this gets dissociated. Uh, so, this bicarbonate ion which is released here. So, there is these ions there are two three things happen this H plus ion through transporter moves inside. So, this side is the lumen side of it and this side is the interstitial fluid. Okay. So, essentially what is happening is that these two ions are transported independently by a mechanism. Okay. So, hydrogen ion generated inside the parietal cell as the as the enzyme carbonic anhydrase converts the carbon dioxide and water to carbonic acid which is H 2 CO 3 what you could see here. Then the carbonic acid promptly dissociate okay, into H plus and H CO 3 minus. Okay. The hydrogen are actively transported into the lumen. So, this hydrogen is actively transported into the one second into the lumen area and whereas, the bicarbonate ion which are produced here is CO 3 is transported into the interstitial fluid. So, these they follow a two different. So, there is a counter transport mechanism. So, this is a classic case of between these two this one and this one there is a counter transport. Okay. So, after this what happens this H plus which is being moved out there from outside from the interstitial fluid the chloride is being transported like this. And this chloride transport and H C O 3 ejection is a is a reversible. So, on one direction what is happening is that the bicarbonate is being released out of the cell and chloride is being taken up the cell. Okay. So, it is a it is a kind of a. So, there is a mechanism by which there are two reverse processes are which are happening. So, carbon dioxide sorry chloride is getting inside the cell and bicarbonate is sent out of the cell. 
counter transport. Okay, there was a co-transport. There is a counter transport taking place. Okay, so after this, what happened is that once this chloride is being sent here, then this chloride, so diffusion process moves inside the lumen. So now you have the source of H plus and Cl minus, and this side, what you are seeing, this side is the pit. So this is where they are throwing out these two, and whereas when this HCO3 is coming on this side, this leads to an event which is called alkaline tide. This makes the interstitial fluid fairly alkaline. There is a sudden influx of the bicarbonate ion. So, what this HCl does? So, the pH goes to 1.5 to 2, and what it essentially does, it kills all the microbes. This is the major job it does. The second thing it does, it denatures the protein and inactivate most of the enzyme of the food. Most of the enzymes of food okay. and the third important thing it does is that it, it helps to break down the plant cell wall and a connective tissue in the meat. So, plant cell, because we have a lot of vegetarian diet plant cell wall breakage and connective tissue of meat is being broken down. Okay. And lastly this acidic environment does a second set of job acidic environment leads to the activation of essentially the activation and function of pepsin, which is basically a protein digestive enzyme secreted by the chef cells, which are just underneath it. So, it follows four actions. Once it creates an acidic environment, by which most of the microbes are being killed. The second thing it does, it denatures all the proteins and the enzymes present in the food. Third thing it does, it get rid of, it breaks down, chops down the plant cell walls and the connective tissue of the non-vegetarian part of the food. And lastly what it does, it promotes the secretion of pepsin, which is secreted by the chief cells. So, we talked about the parietal cells, underneath you have the chief cells. So, now we will talk about what the chief cells are doing out there. So, coming to the chief cells. So, what the chief cells are essentially doing is that they are more abundant near the base as you must remember like I was when I was drawing the pit like this they are mostly concentrated out here along the pit and, and this is the pit where all the H plus and C L minus are falling. Okay. So, this is the H C L pit. Okay. So, they are more towards the base of the gastric pit, this is the major location of it and these cells secretes pepsinogen and which is an inactive proenzyme and it has inactive proenzyme and this pepsinogen is converted pepsinogen is converted to pepsin presence of acid and this acid is being supplied by the parietal cells which are present there okay so essentially this pepsin is most functions most effectively at the ph of 1.5 to 2 that is the zone where it acts its activity is maximum. Okay. So, we talked about the parietal cells, we talked about the chief cells, still there is one more cell at the bottom of the pit. If you remember while I was drawing it, I showed you that there are certain cells which are which are present here, which I call the G cells. Okay. So, if we go back you will see that uh, next one. Yeah, look at 
these are the cells. We have not talked about this. So, we have talked about this, we have talked about this. So, this is the one. So, if I so from here coming H plus and C L minus, okay. And these are the ones which are secreting pepsin. Now, let us talk about the third one in the line, which is the one second, okay, which are the G cells. Okay. So, pyloric gland which is secreting the. So, these are <coughs> basically they secrete a hormone called gastrin, which is produced by the G cells. And what gastrin does? So, so basically gastrin is produced by the G cells and G cells are most abundant in the gastric pit of the pyloric antrum and gastrin stimulates that this is what gastrin does. So, the function of gastrin is that it stimulates couple of things it stimulates the secretion of a parietal and the chief cells. So, secretion of parietal and chief cells this is its major function this is one of the function of it and it has a second function second function is that so there is along this there is a contractile movement which is essential so contractile movement of the gastric wall this contractile movement is being supported by this gastrin and this is extremely essential it's it's something like this the food has to be continuously in motion it's just like you are you take you know how you mix the dough dough while you are making bread it is just you have to mix it you so mush it up you have to really you know push it through so it has to go through this whole motion that motion is being promoted by the by this hormone called gastrin which is secreted by those G cells which are at the base of the gastric pit. So, that is the function of it. Okay. So, now we have pretty much enumerated there is a couple of more small details which. Uh, so, this spiral gland also contain there is something called D cells which I have not mentioned in the picture they are very few in numbers and they release something called somatostatin which is an hormone that inhibits gastrin release. So, this is kind of uh, if this is the inhibitory signal I am drawing gastrin. So, in other word the D cells which are present in the gastric pit are regulating the secretion of the G cells which are secreting gastrin. So, it is a auto mechanism which regulates when the gastrin has to secrete because when the gastrin is secreting when the G cell is secreting gastrin. So, that will stimulate the parietal cells and the chief cells and eventually the secretion of acid by the parietal cell will be enhanced and the secretion of pepsin by the chief cells will be enhanced. So, somatostatin is the one which comes into play and ensures the gastrin secretion is being regulated and thereby preventing the excess secretion of acid. So, overall if I had to summarize the cellular structure, so we talked about the anatomy now we are at the cellular structure. So, there are three types of cells parietal cells, chief cells, G cells and D cells. Parietal cells are involved in hydrochloric acid formation, chief cells are involved in pepsin formation and uh, your G cells are involved in gastrin formation and D cells are involved in somatostatin formation which regulates the gastrin secretion. Okay. So, now after this after talking telling you the anatomy overall anatomy cellular anatomy and the structure of the gastric pit but just one more just kind of for understanding sake. So, if you look at this structure which is more like this. So, this whole thing has pits like this. So, 
these are the pits where all the processes in a three dimension just imagine this picture in a three dimension just a section I have drawn. Okay. So, from here we will move on to the regulation of the gastric activity and gastric activity is regulated at three different stages there are three different stages. So, one of the stage is called the cephalic stage and it is called the intestinal stage and in between there is another stage we will which will be talking about soon. Okay. So, let us get back to the slides about once again about the regulation of gastric activity. regulation of gastric activity. So, you have the I was telling you there are three phases by which it is being regulated cephalic phase, gastric phase and intestinal phase. So, what is cephalic phase? It is very interesting that this all this secretion process if we talk about the cephalic phase starts much before the food reaches the stomach. This you might wonder how that happens, because whenever you smell a good food or some really nice something is frying you get a temptation ah oh, wow I should eat that. By that time, the nerve innervation along the stomach leads to the secretion of a whole bunch of chemicals, and that is where the cephalic phase gets initiated. So, the food has not reached there, by the way, you just smell something and you just taste, maybe uh, you do like this, you taste something, and already your stomach is getting ready. Oh, something is coming, I have to secrete, you know, hydrochloric acid, pepsin, and all other things to ensure I can break the stuff. Okay. So, that is where we are talking about the cephalic phase and that is why in the first class I was telling you be very careful this is very well innervated network of neurons and blood vessels. They are continuously helping this system like autonomous unit to do its function. So, let us get some of the details of the cephalic phase. Okay. So, cephalic phase. Okay. Cephalic phase starts with these are the stimulus. A sight, even the sight of the food is smell, taste, or the most important thought for food initiates. These are the signal which initiates the cephalic phase. And interestingly, what is happening? in the stomach during that time, these are the reactions which are taking place in the stomach. So, from the central nervous system I am putting them in red uh, sorry in maroon. So, from the central nervous system these signals are coming through the vagus nerves okay. and they are stimulating the mucus cells chief cells, parietal cells and the G cells okay. and mucus starts secreting these are the mucus cells, mucus these this chief cells start secreting pepsinogen, and they start secreting HCL and the G cells you know it starts secreting the gastrin. So, this duration is very short, it is a short duration event and essentially what is happening during this phase, the stomach is priming up itself that some food will be arriving and there is some degree of secretion. So, if you continuously think about food, there will already be a secretion of hydrochloric acid which you may not even be aware of just by the sheer thinking of the food it could you know change your like you know milieu within the stomach. From here we move on to the phase 2 which is slightly longer phase which is the gastric phase. Okay. Let us move on to the gastric phase. So, gastric phase lasts for around 3 to 4 hours 
and gastric phase of course, uh, 3 to 4 hours and uh, it basically what it does it enhance the enhance secretion of HCL, pepsin and the gastrin and all other things which are involved in it and uh, it creates a prolonged acidic environment for the food to you know kind of get ready for absorption in the stomach okay this is what it does and during that phase there are a few other receptors which are getting activated so this is the stomach out here so from the central nervous system we have talked about the mucus cells i'm just putting at ms mc okay mucus cells are secreting the mucus by n and you have the parietal cells secreting hcl you have the chafed cells cc are secreting the pepsin okay so here this all these are helping the food i'm i'm just representing by red the bolus of the food to mix and apart from it there is a huge rise of the pH in this situation and the stretch receptors here these are the stretch receptors which I, I told you that they are longitudinal muscles and there are circular muscle stretch receptor chemo receptors all gets activated. Okay. So, this is the zone where there is huge amount of blood starts flowing into this all this area and it is kind of action like this if I had to kind of action like this there is a lot of movement which is taking place because of these different stretch receptors which are there. So, this is a phase where the food is kind of going through a, just like imagine when your mother in the uh, mother in the kitchen. Uh, uh, uses a grinder the food is like you know churning 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 churning. So, this is exactly the churning phase when the food is kind of getting churned up it's just like a mixy there is a lot of movement there is a circular motion like this there is longitudinal motion like this and it is kind of in a different dimension it moves and this is where your food is kind of getting all mixed up with pepsin hydrochloric acid ensuring that it every bit of molecule the HCL and all other. Uh, pepsin and other component reaches and ensure the food is broken down to as much smaller fragments as possible, because the smaller the fragment it will be easier for the intestine to absorb as much nutrient it can afford to absorb from food. Okay. So, this is our gastric phase from gastric phase we move on to the cephalic phase which is the third and the final phase of it. Okay. So, sorry the intestinal phase I am I'm, I'm sorry just uh, pardon me intestinal phase this is just before entering the intestine. So, at this phase there are basically what is happening this is also a very long phase this last for hours. Okay. The cephalic phase is the smallest one then comes 3 to 4 hours phase of churning and this phase is when most of the other things which are involved in circulation. So, this is the phase when your if you remember the D cells get activated ensuring the gastrin secretion is being blocked this is one thing which happens. Then there are a few other controllers which comes into play at this time from the blood vessel which stops the different cells. So, via circulation you have the chief cells parietal cells okay. they are being asked to stop by different factors like CCK, GIP and CCK is basically cholecystokinin, cholecystokinin and GIP is basically gastrin 
inhibitory peptide. The name itself is self explanatory, they stop this shaft cells, P cells and everything to you know stop secretion. The pH starts falling down okay, or I mean go start to go up out here okay, and there is something called myenteric plexus which stops the movement. There is a huge amount of churning which is it is something like that just before this I was telling you there is a lot of churning which is taking place like this. Okay. So, now it is just like a grinder or a food grinder is slowing down, it is now slowing down and the food is almost ready through the pyloric sphincter to move to the intestine for the next series of action. So, this is the overall function at the basic level what is happening in the intestine. So, the food from esophagus enters the intestine and it is exposed to the acid pits, which are formed by the gorge like structures of the cell like this by the parietal cells, chief cells, G cells, D cells and this parietal cell secreting hydrochloric acid or helps in the formation of hydrochloric acid not they secrete hydrochloric acid they secrete H plus ion and chloride ion. So, pardon me that statement is wrong that is actually they secrete H plus ion and chloride ions into the pit and the chief cells are secreting pepsin and this is being further enhanced by the gastrin secreted by the G cells and then there is a lot of mixing of the food taking place. So, initially the first phase is the cephalic phase when just by the thought of food or thinking about it or smelling about it or just tasting about it leads to priming up the stomach. Next phase is the gastric phase where there is a huge amount of movement of the longitudinal circular mus muscle of the stomach and the third phase is the intestinal phase when the food everything this things has started slowing down and food is almost ready as a bolus to move on to the next phase which is the intestinal phase. Okay, so, here I will close in. So, if people can go through some of the very nice pictures given online you can go through Google and you can give and you will see the whole structure what I have drawn you can see much nice three dimensional views of it and how all these transporters are functioning. Okay. So, thanks a lot.